By 1990, Nintendo and Sega had long since established themselves as the powerhouses of console gaming, pushing the likes of Atari and Magnavox more or less entirely out of the market and establishing a space similar to what we have today. The NES launched in the United States in 1985 and is largely credited with saving the game industry from a major crash that it had been going through over the past few years. Widely attributed to Atari, specifically the games E.T. the Extraterrestrial and the part of Pac-Man, both of which are notorious for being incredibly low quality. E.T. in particular is often credited with being the worst game ever made. Whether or not it actually deserves this title is debatable, but it's certainly a contender. In reality though, it wasn't just one or two games that caused the industry chaos. Market saturation, a loss of publishing rights and consumer confidence waning, combined with the increasing popularity of home computers, all contributed to the largest recession video games have ever seen, with the industry dropping an estimated $30 billion globally during that time. This all led to a period of Japanese dominance in the market, Nintendo and Sega filling in the void left by Atari, Magnavox and the ColecoVision amongst others. The NES, or Famicom in Japan, was marketed as an entertainment system, hence the name, rather than a console to largely remove itself from the stigma video games had received. And it worked, selling over 60 million units across its life. Sega's master system, while not being anywhere near as successful as the NES, also used this resurgence of gaming to make its mark, setting itself up for what would become the console war of the next generation. The fourth console generation technically kicked off in 1987 with the TurboGrafx-16, however it wasn't until a few years later when Sega released the Mega Drive, or Genesis as it was known in the US, and Nintendo released the SNES that things really started to heat up. Sega and Nintendo decimated the competition with little effort, and soon turned to working on eradicating each other. While console exclusivity was, and still is, an incredibly anti-consumer practice, it led to the creation of some of the best games ever made and cemented characters like Mario and Sonic in the zeitgeist. What does all of this have to do with Sony and the PlayStation though? Well, everything. During the development of the SNES, Nintendo was in the market for a new sound processor for its upcoming 16-bit console. After seeing his daughter playing a Famicom, and seeing the potential in the medium, an engineer for Sony by the name of Ken Kutaragi reached out to Nintendo in secret, with the aim of developing the sound chip they required. He developed the SCP-700 that was used in the SNES. When the higher-ups at Sony found out, they were understandably furious and rallied to have Kutaragi fired. Fortunately, the CEO of Sony at the time, Norio Oga, saw the potential of video games and supported Kutaragi, allowing him to keep his job. By this point, CDs as a medium had started to gain traction, offering up superb audio quality, massive storage capacity and cheaper production costs when compared to cartridges. A lot of this had been down to Sony and their portable discman systems. Following the success of Nintendo and Sony's partnership on the SCP-700 sound chip, Nintendo decided to work on a CD-based add-on for the SNES. The combination of their partnership on the aforementioned sound chip and Sony's work in making the CD format viable made them the obvious choice for this, and so another partnership was formed. Unfortunately, the deal made then-president of Nintendo, Hiroshi Yamauchi, very uncomfortable. It allowed Sony to keep full rights to the Super Disc format. This effectively massively reduced the amount of control Nintendo had over licensing, something that they were used to having exclusive control over on the NES. In secret, Nintendo of America sent its president, Minoru Arakawa, to Amsterdam, to meet with executives at Philips, Sony's biggest rival at the time. It was hoped that they would be able to strike a deal that would be more favourable to Nintendo, specifically in the area of software licensing, hopefully giving them what was effectively full control again. During this time, several hundred disk system prototypes were made and sent out, and then with the Nintendo PlayStation. It is believed that only one of these prototypes remains, with the others being destroyed by Nintendo. It recently sold for over $300,000 at auction. The add-on was officially revealed by Sony at the 1991 Consumer Electronics Show. One day later at the same show, Nintendo revealed their new partnership with Philips, much to the surprise of everyone in the audience, including Sony. The partnership between Nintendo and Sony somehow didn't immediately fall apart though. The two worked on a deal that would allow Sony to produce hardware for the SNES 
but with Nintendo retaining all software licensing rights. This was short-lived, however, and within a year, Sony had entirely backed out of the partnership and ceased any development of the SNES CD add-on. This could have been the end of Sony's foray into the gaming space if it weren't for Kutaragi and Oga, the former of which was insistent on Sony continuing to make some headway into the gaming industry. It fell to a board meeting, with Kutaragi unveiling a prototype of a CD-based console that he'd been working on, in secret naturally, to try and swear the senior members of the company that this was the way forward. There was still a consensus among many of the older members that Nintendo and Sega were toy companies and as such this was a fool's errand that wasn't really worth pursuing. After all, Sony was a tech company, not a toy manufacturer. Ultimately, Ogre was swayed by Kutaragi, reminding him of the embarrassment that Sony had suffered by Nintendo. From this point onward, he became one of the biggest supporters of Kutaragi and what would become the PlayStation. The work that had been undertaken with Nintendo formed a solid basis for what would become the PlayStation. Sony realised early on though, that one area where they had no chance of competing at all, at least initially, was in the area of games. This is a pretty big stumbling block for someone wanting to sell games consoles. Having no internal game studios, or even franchises that they could use, Sony reached out to leading development studios and publishers in the industry, in order to attempt to build a strong lineup of third party games. They did an admirable job, convincing giants of the industry like Namco, Capcom, EA and Konami to develop for the PlayStation. Square Enix, then known as Squaresoft, jumped ship from Nintendo to Sony, bringing their Final Fantasy series with them. Enticed by the advantages of CDs as a medium of the cartridges Nintendo intended to continue with for at least another generation. While the traditional cartridge had its advantage for games, an almost total lack of loading times, and generally being a very strong and robust format that could take a bit of a beating, they generally lacked storage space and were often incredibly expensive to produce. CDs beat them on both of these fronts. N64 carts maxed out at around 64 megabytes, with CDs being 10 times that. This newfound space allowed developers to stretch their legs and use high quality Redbook audio that was previously unheard of for consoles. Sony being in control of the distribution of the CDs that the PlayStation would use massively reduced costs that they were able to pass on to publishers to further entice them to make use of the platform. Some of the largest, most established and beloved franchises in the industry today got a start as a result of this. Games like Resident Evil, Wipeout, Tekken and Tomb Raider all started life out on the PlayStation. Wipeout specifically was Sony's first step into getting first party games produced, acquiring the Liverpool based development studio Psygnosis in 1993. This was also instrumental in making the PlayStation easy to develop for. Psygnosis staff initially took issue with the workstations that they were expected to develop on, instead approaching SN Systems, another UK based company, to make what essentially became development kits that would run on more traditional PC hardware. They were pitched to Sony at the 1994 Consumer Electronics Show impressing them suitably enough in order for them to become the main development kits for the PlayStation. They evidently did a good job, as SN Systems have made the dev kits for all subsequent PlayStation consoles to this day and been officially acquired by Sony in 2005. This approach became central to Sony's ethos for game development, wanting it to be as simple and accessible as possible. The PlayStation was released in Japan on December 3rd, 1994, one week after the Sega Saturn and the rest of the world in September of the following year. The sales figures, when compared to the Saturn in Japan, don't necessarily make the PlayStation look all that great, with Sega shifting 200,000 units on launch day to Sony's 100,000. However, Sega was an already established gaming brand with a rich history in Japan, especially in arcades, a part of Virtua Fighter being released with the Saturn contributing massively to the sales. PlayStation was a new brand, with no prior history or marketable franchises. Considering that they were effectively starting at the bottom in terms of brand recognition etc. is incredibly impressive. Things went a little differently upon the release in North America and Europe though. At what was the first E3 in May 1995, during a long keynote presentation, Sega announced that the Saturn would retail at $399. This was a pretty high price when you consider that other than a few outliers such as the Neo Geo retailing at $600, 
consoles had generally released around the $200 mark in the US up to this point. This was all immediately followed by a Sony presentation, which remains one of the best things ever seen at E3. Sony was serious and they were confident. Sony's undercut of $100 prompted Sega to release the Saturn four months early to selected retailers in the US in order to give it an advantage over the PlayStation. This rather understandably made some retailers a little upset and they decided to drop Sega's platform. Walmart amongst others was dropping the Saturn completely refusing to sell it at all. Within two days of its launch on September 9th, the PlayStation had sold more units than the Saturn had managed to sell in the five months since its early release. The Saturn was notoriously short-lived in North America and Europe, discontinued within a few short years, in part down to abysmal sales relative to the PlayStation and N64. Sony used these early moments of the console's life to really start to establish a brand. Up to this point, most consoles had used letters or occasionally numbers to represent the different buttons on a controller, and beyond the logo for the snares mimicking the colours that were used, this was usually about as far as it went. Sony took it a step further using easily readable, theoretically universal symbols on the controller that also became part of their identity. Cross and circle represented yes or no, or confirm and cancel. These are often reversed in western games compared to Japanese releases though. Square represented a sheet of paper, meant to symbolise menus and was often used for this. And finally triangle was a point of view or vision cone. Sony still make heavy use of this in their marketing and it's synonymous with the PlayStation now, even more so than the actual PlayStation logo which has changed subtly over the years, unlike the symbols. A few years into the life of the PlayStation, the dual analog controller was released. More or less identical to the original controller, only now featuring two additional analog joysticks, for better control in a rapidly evolving 3D gaming world. This was supplanted later the same year by the DualShock controller, again more or less the same, only now with two motors to create force feedback in supporting games. This became the standard for PlayStation controllers moving forward, with only subtle revisions and changes up until the PS4's edition of a touchpad and the DualSense controller on the PS5. While Sony wasn't the first to bring analogue thumbsticks to games, Sega and Nintendo were both bringing them to controllers long before the PlayStation had one, it was the world's first dual stick controller and remains the standard today. Sony and the PlayStation absolutely obliterated the fifth console generation. Nintendo's dominance over the previous decades ending rather abruptly, establishing Sony as one of the giants of the game industry in a relatively short time. In the six years that it was considered to be a current gen, it sold somewhere in the region of 80 million units, and by the time it was officially discontinued by Sony in 2006, over 100 million units had been sold, putting it as the fifth best selling console of all time at the time of writing with two of the other top five slots being occupied by other more recent PlayStation systems. Much of this success was down to Sony's embracing of third-party developers early on, something that Nintendo has and to some extent continues to struggle with. Many of the games released during this generation are hailed as some of the best ever created, and with good reason. Final Fantasy VII springs to mind, and often sits atop best game ever lists along with titles such as Metal Gear Solid and Nintendo's The Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time. This may, in part, be due to some simply fantastic games being produced during this time. It's undeniable that many of today's most popular franchises established themselves in the 90s on the PlayStation, but also in part due to the sheer volume of games released on the system. Over 7,000 games were commercially released on the PS1, and this is an age where the internet was still not particularly widespread, and digital distribution was still a few years away from being a thing for those who did have access. Magazines with demo discs helped promote small titles and new IPs. It was genuinely exciting to grab the latest issue of official UK PlayStation magazine every month to see what new games were on the disc. My first introduction to Resident Evil, Metal Gear Solid and Spyro amongst many others was through these monthly discs. I'm saddened that the internet age has pretty much entirely killed off this form of discovery for new games. Admittedly it is much better now in general, it's much easier to just check the console store or jump onto your preferred news site to find out what's coming soon but something has definitely been lost from the process. 
One of the more interesting and frankly coolest additions to these demo discs was a small section called Net Your Rose Games. Keeping in line with Sony's strategy of making the PlayStation accessible to develop for, they created and released a new version of the console in 1996 to act as a development kit for hobbyists. This sleek, black version of the console acted as a debugging unit and was called the Net Euros PlayStation. Retailing at a relatively cheap $750 compared to the official dev kits, which came in at around $4,000. It was a low cost way to start developing games for the PlayStation, with only a PC and some programming knowledge being required. They weren't as feature complete as the main dev kits, but at less than a quarter of a price, this was hardly surprising. Many of the games produced on this hardware featured on official PlayStation Magazine's monthly disc with several of them going on to become full-fledged retail releases, and with the creator of one game, Mitsudo Kamiyama, going on to become the director of the Final Fantasy Crystal Chronicles series at Square Enix. Throughout its 12-year lifespan, the original PlayStation became one of the most recognisable and iconic brands in gaming history, and established itself as part of what we now know as the Big Three, the giants of Nintendo, Sony and Microsoft. It helped push gaming further into the mainstream and introduced millions of people to thousands of new worlds, characters and experiences. While it isn't the console that got me into playing games, the Sega Master System's to blame for that, and it isn't the console I remember the most fondly, that being the Xbox 360 for some reason, it is definitely the most influential part of the gaming world in my life, with most of my own personal best games of all time list hailing from the PS1. Next time I'll be taking a look at what Sony did next, their sophomore effort, the unoriginally named PlayStation 2, and how they once again changed everything. As always, if you've managed to get this far into the video, please consider leaving a like and subscribing. What was your favourite game on the PS1? Or did you prefer the N64 or Saturn? Let me know down in the comments.